welcome to the Authentic Man podcast. I am your host, David Chambers. This is a podcast for men who want more and less from life. More deep connection, more emotional intelligence, more self-awareness and more great sex. And less. Less heartache, less conflict, less overthinking and less stress. Creating dating lives, sex lives and relationships that are incredible and authentic. My deepest goal is that you, the listener, can take away what you hear in this podcast and apply it to your life so that you can experience greater happiness, transformational growth, deeper relationships and profound sexual intimacy. I believe that as men, we are capable of so much more depth than we are shown or led to believe. So join me as we get deep into this. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to another episode of the Authentic Man podcast. I'm your host, David Chambers. This is another wonderful episode of the podcast, one that is really to help you be happier. And isn't that something that we all want a little bit more of, um, to experience happiness, to experience more satisfaction and joy in our lives? Um, you know, I think that's why a lot of people come for coaching, you know, and as a, a men's coach, a man who coaches men around dating, relations, with intimacy, I see that happiness is a really vital part of how we want to move forward. Well, the question is, is, is happiness that important as well? Um, yeah, questions like this are answered in today's episode. Um, I've got a wonderful man in the shape of Ed Cunningham. Um, he's a man I've followed for quite a long time. He's a, He runs a podcast called The Need to Read, as well as an Instagram account by the same name. He's a podcaster, writer, content creator, um, all-round um, investigator. You know, He's really... Um, he, as he talks about on the podcast, and really, you know, become quite obsessed with reading. And actually, we talk a fair bit about reading because, uh, you know, a big part of what he does is, is is talk about books and reading. And he consumes massive amounts of books. And he talks about how he consumes that amount of books, which is is awesome to hear. Um, but actually, the the main content of the podcast is really about happiness. You know, we talk about things like is suffering good for human beings? Is it good for us to suffer a little bit? We talk about this deserving nature, like, do we deserve love? Do we deserve happiness? Do we deserve anything? Um, you know, it, I'm, I'm not going to say anything more than that, but we talk about that. Um, we talk about social media and happiness and how that affects our happiness. Um, I talk about how I interact with social media in a way that works for me. Um, we talk a little bit about how people sell the dream of happiness and how to get there and sometimes don't actually live it for themselves. Um, and we talk a lot about contentment and satisfaction and how we can find contentment and satisfaction in our lives. Um, and we talk about whether what's more important, contentment, satisfaction, happiness. Um, and we talk about meditation. Um, Ed has an incredible streak, which he'll probably he mentioned in the podcast. Um, and he actually talks about how he got to such a wonderful, you know, when I say streak, it's like meditating day in, day out uh, in a row. Um, and we talk about the effects of meditation on happiness um, because I've been an avid meditator, not to the level of Ed, not to the consistency of Ed, but for a number of years. Um, and I've definitely seen a, a difference for myself when I'm really um, diligent with my meditation and I, I give it enough space and time, a difference in my ability to be present and be with people and so forth. So there's a lot to chew on in this episode because, like I said, happiness is something that we really do spend a lot of time thinking about. And concerning ourselves about, and you know, whether we are happy or not, what does it mean? God, you know, even that, what does it mean if we're not happy? A question I often uh, ask in my coaching sessions is like, what does it mean about you if you're not happy? Yeah, so you can sit with that for a little bit. But before we jump into the episode, just to let you know, I've got a, a men's program that I'm running, which I've imaginedly very imaginatively called um, the Authentic Man Program. It's an eight-week program for men, and we're going to be diving into things like awareness, self-awareness. How do we increase our self-awareness? Why are we? Why do we think we're more aware than we are? 
um, presence. I'm going to talk a lot about, there's going to be some modules in about sexuality and leadership in life, in love, in relationships. Um, I'm going to get into some emotional expression and feeling and letting go of emotion. Um, I've got various wonderful um, practices that will be showing you during the program to really let go of emotion and feel more emotionally free and communicate from a place of freedom and love and care. So there's a lot of really juicy stuff in it. Um, and it's getting quite close. It's about, it starts at the back end of May. I'm doing an open circle on the 29th, which is a Sunday. So if you're interested, you know, there's going to be some more details in the show notes where I put a link to a web page that I created. So you can have a look at the ins and outs, the nuts and bolts. But if you're a, a regular listener to this podcast and you enjoy the podcast, then the chances are this program is perfect for you because I'm talking about a lot of the things that I talk about a lot here on an Instagram. So please get in touch if it's something that's interesting to you. Or you feel if you feel called in a way, that can even feel like feeling a bit afraid to join. That's often a calling that's something we need to push past and and, and, and work on. I'm also running a um, Foundations of a Conscious Relationship with Orsa, my partner, um, on the 15th of May. Um, that's Sunday. It's like 5 p.m. UK time. You can adjust it for wherever you're in the world. Um, that's a free event. Again, I'll put the, the details in the show notes. You can come to that for free. It doesn't cost anything. Um, and actually, if you can't make the date, don't worry, because that will be recorded, so which means that you get a free recording of that as well. But you still need to buy it. You need to get, not purchase a ticket because it's free, but you need to get a ticket so that you get the recording um, the next day. So yeah, that's it for today. Well, until we get into the podcast, which is going to come in and nuts. So yeah, um, I hope you enjoy this one. Love to hear about your thoughts about it later on. Afternoon, listeners, or morning or evening, depending where you are, where you're coming in from. Um, another wonderful episode. It's about a topic that I think we talk about a lot. I think that's something that I think we obsess about far too much, um, that we place too much meaning on, and that maybe we've got all wrong and a bit fucked up, if I'm honest. Um, and I have a guest is someone who I, I came across on Instagram a long time ago and was in awe of his ability to read. But also I started to see that he was really researching um, in quite a thorough manner this topic, really talking about it from a point of view that was challenging, that was interesting, that was kind of counterintuitive in ways. Um, and I had with me Ed Cunningham. Ed is a podcaster and, and a writer and a wonderful Instagrammer and a very, very funny man on top of that. Hello, Ed. Thank you very much for having me, mate. It's it's very good to be here, and I'm and I'm happy with that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Trying to be more creative with my introductions these days. Um, and yeah, um, Ed runs a podcast called "A Need to Read." He managed to read. I think he's read like two million books in his in his short time being alive. I managed to see that he goes through like every couple of days, there's a new book that he's finished that he's telling people about, which is like something I'm in incredible awe of because I read about three pages a day. So books take me like so long to finish. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, about a hundred days per any decent sized book, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, you got to get obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> is that the key obsession? think so i don't know if i'd recommend it to people but that's that's where i'm at at the moment okay okay i guess a good question for that is is how did you yeah how did you come to be this man that just reads 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 and is obsessed with reading what led you to to where you are now so i didn't read at all when i was in school like i'd watch the films to kind of based essays off of that just thought if I knew the general gist of a story then I could assess the literature that I hadn't read uh continued being a non-reader until I was like 23 24 and I was working a call center job at the time thought I'd start reading about sales read all the like scammy books like 
10x by grant cardone and all all of those books that are just like you need to work way too hard so that you'll never be happy and then maybe at some point in the future you'll be happy um and all of the like sales books i almost and i'm glad i never did almost read donald trump's book um <laughs> before i realized that there was there was an issue uh and then i started reading some non-fiction books and it started with like mark manson's a subtle art of not giving a fuck which i feel like is everyone's like gateway book in into self-development um and I just started noticing improvement in my life like how I was holding myself emotionally like living a value-driven life all of these things I was like well it doesn't actually take me that long to read a book or to mull over what I've read so I'll just start reading more and then I was listening to a lot of audiobooks, listening to a lot of Joe Rogan at the time, old Bro Rogan, getting any of the authors that he was having on and, and buying their books. And yeah, it's just been a gradual progression into complete obsession, which is where I'm at like now is complete obsession. And I, th- I thought at some point this would like die down and I would care a little bit less about reading, but no, it only seems to be getting worse slash better. Um, so yeah, I just essentially didn't read, noticed that reading could actually help me understand some things about myself and the world, then couldn't stop. Wow. Wow. And if the subtle art of not giving a fuck was like your kind of gateway book, I'm trying to think when that came out, that's not even that long ago. That's what, less than 10 years? Oh yeah, no. So I started reading three years ago, maybe, maybe three and a half. Wow. Like wow. that, that, I think that it helps that it's a new thing, like mm. kind of new. So I'm 27 now. I started reading when I was 23, 24. So yeah, three, three and a half years, maybe coming up to four soon. Um, it's how long I've been reading for. And I think in that time, it's like 230 books I've read over, over that period. But it's, it's, I think I'm on like 40 for this year, which I wouldn't recommend anyone read that much. It, it gets in the way <laughs> wow that's incredible 40 books of a year so you what do you i'm really interested this is really just personal uh, questions to be honest like how many hours a day do you read surprisingly not even that much i, I would wow. say an hour to two hours wow um but then if i'm reading like a good novel I might mm. sit and read that for three hours. Mm. So it, it really, really depends on the book. If it's like a dry nonfiction book, I'll just take that in like 20 minute, half an hour chunks. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. The speed you must read is incredible. I know I read incredibly slowly and then I'm like, ah, oh, you must be just like flicking through the pages, like minute by minute. Not even that's the things like yeah. people really overcomplicate it, but reading is one of those things like we all know how to read kind of, and, and there'll be books that will make you think the total opposite of that. When you come across someone who's like really smart, like I've been reading some Christopher Hitchens recently and he is dangerous with a pen. Like he is such a good writer and reading his work just makes you feel stupid. Some people get to that point of feeling stupid from a book because they don't understand some of the words and then they just give up. Whereas I have this, obsession with trying not to be stupid so if i come across like a book that's really difficult i'm like well i might not be able to read it just yet but six months of gradually getting harder books in i'll be able to read that and and not struggle and that'll be nice progress and then i'll feel less stupid and then maybe i'll be happy (laughs) Yeah, I, I had a similar, I had an experience with a book years ago, and I always remember the title it was like The History of Racism. And it felt like a very academic book because it's one of those, and this is before the days where you could have a decent dictionary on your smartphone. So I would read this book, and I'd like every two sentences, I'd get to a word and I'm like, I don't know what this word means. Like, what the fuck does this mean? And I can't understand the sentence unless I know what this word means. And I used to read a lot when I used to go in and go to work um, on the tube. So I used to be like waiting until there was some signal sometimes. I had to have two books at this point. So I get to this word and be like, oh, I've got some signal. Let me just type that in. What does that mean? Oh, that means that. Oh, okay, cool. Now I can continue reading. But it was this very frustrating point of like dipping in and out of this book. And like you said, feeling like 
like, oh man, I'm a bit stupid. I can't, I could barely get through a page of this through fully understanding or having to read pages twice often just to like mm-hmm. get a decent understanding and be like, oh, I know I get this thing. It's come from this. But um, yeah, reading and feeling stupid. It must stop a lot of people actually from continuing with, with their reading journey because they're like, oh, I feel stupid. And I have an aversion to this uncomfortable emotion of feeling stupid. So let me just play on my iPhone and scroll through Instagram instead. Yeah, it's, it's more comfortable to like hide from your own stupidity than it is to like lean into it and kind of attack it, right? And and I think our the age we live in caters very well to people who want to avoid doing stuff, right? Mm. Like there's a lots of of easy ways you can just take your mind somewhere else. Um, I don't think that's very good for society. Um, so like reading for me gives me a chance to slow down a bit as well, which I, which I quite like. And it forces you to kind of like mull over the words. Like maybe you'll read a paragraph and it'll hit you and make you think about your life. And then you're sat there for three minutes thinking, God, am I doing this right? Or am I doing this wrong? Or how can I like maybe make a change that would, would improve things? It gets you to think it like it forces you to slow down, which is, which is a good thing. Yeah. We live in a very fast world and it, it's just getting faster mm-hmm. and we don't always get many opportunities to slow down, especially you know, on regular life, as you said, like reading, because there's only so many words you can consume in a minute. It forces you to kind of slow down and be with those words and with those concepts and ideas and reflect and put our phones to one side. And it's not digital, you know, it's not like mm-hmm. racing past us. It's not an image. Um, so yeah, slowing down is, you know, even as my work as a coach is something that I, I do a lot with my clients. It's like, how can you find ways in your life to slow down? Can you find 10 minutes in your day where you do fuck all and just sit yeah. and look out the window? <laughs> yeah. And that's tough in itself. Just to, like dropping everything mm. is, is tough. And like, I'll, I'll read to avoid doing that to like actually have to sit down with myself and be like, Oh God, <laughs> here, here comes that voice. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know that feeling well so we're going to talk about happiness as i said obviously before mm. and i'm interested in your journey to a certain degree like i get this sense that though you're obsessed with reading as i get the feeling at this mo- at this moment or maybe moments not too distant <clears throat> in the past from this moment that you became quite obsessed with the idea of happiness and learning about this idea of happiness. And I'm interested in like, why did this obsession take hold of you? I think it's because I was already obsessed with happiness in the wrong way, in the way that's like, I'm going to find this and I'm going to hold on to it very tightly. And if it tries to butt me off, I'm only going to hold on even tighter. Mm. And I realized that wasn't working for me. Uh, Like every time that I, was happy I would then be thinking how happy was I what have I done to make myself be happy and and there's there's a quote by John Stuart Mill he's like an old philosopher and he says an old philosopher I'll reference a lot of old philosophers today I like them even if they weren't great people a lot of them were pretty smart and he says ask yourself if you're happy and you cease to be so Mm. and it's it's about that like staying present and I think people are so focused on achieving happiness as if it's something you could ever really like achieve it's not like it's a reward for doing a certain amount of things or like you've gone to the gym five times this week you're going to be happy it doesn't it doesn't quite work like that and I just started to worry that people were aiming at it too much which means that I was worried that I was aiming at it too much right um so I started to have a look into what actually makes people happy and the standard things like money it does to a certain degree and then it it, the returns like diminish after like i think adjusted for inflation is now like 84 grand a year holding household income on top of that you don't get much returns on happiness you do on satisfaction but but not on the happiness side of things that people are, are aiming for so relentlessly and then it comes to the same for any of people's goals and I'm writing something in a moment about people's dream life because I, I want people to give up on that as well. <laughs> um, the whole idea of hedonic adaption is that whenever you reach a certain thing, like you're, you're going to end up getting used to it and then it will 
cease to be good enough for you because that is how evolution has wired us. We reach for something, we get it. After a little while, we're like, hmm, maybe maybe I'll have a bit more of this, please. Or, or maybe I'll have something different because this isn't working for me anymore. And and that's sad. And even like someone like Daniel Kahneman, who's like one of the world's most renowned um, psychologists, left the field of happiness because he was like, what actually matters for people's lives is not how happy they are, but their sense of satisfaction. And happiness doesn't come into satisfaction. You can have a horrible day doing some terrible things that you would never choose to do, but in service of a higher goal. Let's take like, I, I know some people who have gone out to Poland and, and Ukraine to help with um, what's going on over there. And I'm sure their days are not filled with joy, but at the end of the day, they are wholly satisfied and feel good about what they've been doing. Um, whereas if you just went somewhere and had the whole like Marguerite's on the beach thing, you can have a great day happiness wise, but at the end of the day, like God, I don't fuck all what a piece of shit I am. God. <laughs> It's uh, so it makes for quite a confusing thing because we're all told to like we want to be happy, we want to be happy, but really do we? And I think so sometimes you can you can go the other way and completely drop happiness and and aim way too much at satisfaction and forget to actually smile every now and then and enjoy it. And I guess it's about striking a balance between this like happiness and satisfaction. As I hear that, I'm thinking of the. <clears throat> the emotional will and it's like and it's a, it's a tool I use a lot because I like to be in some understanding of what I'm feeling but it's like happiness is only one of those things there's lots mm. of other really great emotions we can feel on there and it's only one of them and if we're spending all our time kind of obsessing with this one particular emotion the one flavor of emotion even that we're we're the kind of aiming for we kind of lose our ability to take any joy or satisfaction from experiencing the others because they all have something beneficial in some way you know even some of the ones that we avoid the negative ones like anger and frustration there's there's often something there for us to to learn or take away from that or just simply to to experience and let go of Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting what you said about hedonic adaption um I've always just called it kind of normalizing you know Mm -hmm. it becomes this point where if you lived in a gold plated house, when you first walk in, you'd be like, my God, this is the most amazing thing. But after being there for maybe three months, you'd be like, there's a fucking scratch on the wall. And that scratch annoys me so much. And you wouldn't really enjoy it so much anymore. You know, it's just kind of how we, I see in my own life, but I see in so many other people's lives, we're always kind of um, looking at things slowly just become normal. They just fade into the background of our lives. Mm. And we then look for a new problem to solve. Yeah, we are pretty stupid humans. We just underestimate our ability to be dissatisfied. Like, Mm. I can be dissatisfied anywhere. (laughs) Give me enough time, I'll get annoyed at something. And I don't know if I'm just being more honest about it or if other people just don't feel this and I'm crazy, but I I feel like it's there's there's something in that. There's, There's something in understanding your ability to be dissatisfied with whatever life's give you. That, that people should look into a little bit more when, when they're thinking about these like goals and, and things that they want to pursue. I've always seen it as dissatis- dis- uh, we are wired for dissatisfaction because it what keeps mm-hmm. us alive. It keeps driving us forward. Um, I'm thinking of, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie and I don't know how relevant this is, but it's just really popped into my head. This movie called Serenity. Is it Serenity? And they're like in space and they're they're like marauders in space and they find this planet where for whatever reason the people that ran the planet pumped this air into the planet that just made people really happy and satisfied and then they just stopped doing anything (laughs) they just stopped moving and then they all just died because they were just so content with just sitting there they just all passed away and it's almost like we are we have this dissatisfaction in our in our kind of genetic makeup because it helps us make our lives better or create a better world or or solve new problems and evolve this 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 yeah. uh, this dissatisfaction is like the driving force i feel behind evolution yeah absolutely and people are so like hell-bent on just avoiding it it, do- it doesn't make sense because we because we know that it's useful like nowadays mm. we we can see that 
yeah, being dissatisfied is not a bad thing. And then there are people who are like labeling vibrational emotions who are like happy, good, sad, bad. Oh, jealousy. You should never feel jealousy. So mm. why not? Why not look at what someone else has and be like, well, I wouldn't mind having a bit of that. Like, I feel like it serves a purpose. It it, it does drive us. And it's it's the whole labeling things good or bad, isn't mm. it? It's sometimes it's annoying to be angry, but sometimes it serves a purpose. We should stop being so rigid in, in labeling these things good and bad. Mm-hmm. Just the labels, as you said, it's like um I grew up in a in a home where anger was bad. You didn't you didn't get angry. Mm. You need to be nice and calm and good and all those things. And I learned that anger was bad, which also now I see as an adult is problematic because say if someone does something to me I don't like, I won't get angry about it. I'll just kind of passively be like, oh, that's fine. Um, <laughs> when really I want to kind of scream and shout because I almost don't have this connection to being angry. It's, and I know we learn through society that anger is bad because we've seen certain acts happen through mm-hmm. anger and it kind of conditions us to this but actually anger is a wonderful driving force for our own lives if we become angry at ourselves you know for our, in, our own inertia for instance we might then get into action and move forward and, and take mm. you know the necessary action to um create more happiness or satisfaction or joy or passion whatever it may be yeah not a lot of, not a lot of people talk about that openly on social media i don't think like that the good use of anger because it's it is labeled as as one of those bad emotions and especially self-directed anger people hate that people want you to be so kind to yourself and i don't understand that my like natural tendency is to be a little bit mean to myself but i like it it keeps me going (laughs) (laughs) if i was too kind to myself like and i've tried i have really tried um and i i'm saying that genetically i don't think i'm i'm meant for the whole like self-love thing um but yeah i think it's such a great driver just to be annoyed at yourself i i love that feeling to be like oh you bastard do a bit better come on like you you know that and i'm sure there are people out there who behave excellently and being angry at themselves isn't warranted but i fuck up all the time so like yeah i should be a bit annoyed at myself at times <laughs> us into um brings us back into integrity of ourselves often mm. yeah 100 percent. i think that's such an important value for someone to have I, I really rate that in someone when they can have an honest look at themselves mm. if we have this happiness that we're all supposedly kind of running towards and then we have suffering right suffering pain um I guess you could even put dissatisfaction inside of suffering. Is suffering good for us as, as human beings? We seek it out enough. Like we're all kind of masochists. It's why people listen to Adele. It's why <laughs> people watch like taboo porns. Like there's a brilliant book by uh, Paul Bloom called the sweet spot. And he literally is, is, trying to search for the key point between suffering and pleasure because they're kind of like the opposites of each other. Um, and it's, it's absolutely necessary. We, we seek it out ourselves through exercise and we, we see that like what doesn't kill us makes us stronger in that sense. But when it comes to our lives, when loss or grief or just like heartbreak comes up, all of a sudden we're like, we can't see the necessity of these things and i'm not saying for someone to like have their heart torn out and then just be sat there smiling thinking how amazing it is that they're going to get to grow from this but to just acknowledge that throughout our lives we're going to be dealt our fair share of suffering we don't necessarily need to go and seek it out and go and fall out with the people we love and, and be in pain because of that but it's going to come for us at some point now and we shouldn't, we shouldn't panic when it does and we shouldn't kind of not expect it. I'm, I'm all for a bit of pessimism. It's like the Stoics, they love it. Um, I think Seneca says like what's most unlooked for is most crushing in, in effect. It's like 
all, all of this well all this all the suffering that comes our way essentially like we we shouldn't be surprised by it <laughs> mm. why why would we be different to everyone else i think especially with us like living in the west and uh, the more i've read about society and the more i've read about the world the more i've understood my privilege and just kind of what a breeze of a life i've had right and there is something about people on the internet at the moment and their obsession with what getting what they deserve and what they think they deserve. And I hate it. I, 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 I can't believe the ignorance of it to um, believe that like, Oh, I think I deserve happiness and, and pleasure. And, and when that comes to me, that's, that's great. That's, that's what I deserve. And when suffering comes to me, like I don't deserve that. It's like, if things were done on who deserved what, I think a lot of people would be very upset with with what they were dealt. <laughs> Mainly for ignorant comments, like people get what they deserve. <laughs> um, so yeah, suffering definitely plays a key role in a good life. And so much so to the point that we seek it out. We listen to sad songs. We do things that put us in pain so we can feel the good part after it. We need that contrast. We need the like, we need to know what the difference is between when things are good and when things are supposedly bad. Because it's like, it's kind of polarizing, isn't it? It's like if we kind of touched upon before with the um, hedonic adaption, it's like if things were good all the time, we no longer see the good anymore. And we'd find something in there where we would perceive as suffering, a bit like I was talking mm. about the scratch on the, the, the gold plate at home. You would see and you'd be like, this scratch, the suffering, it's causing me the pain, the anguish, the sleepless nights, you know. I always use the example of the princess and the pea. You know, you hear this, it's like, you know, they've got this princess and she has everything she wants, but that pea, for her, that pea would have been the thing in her, the bane in her life, you know, the, the, it would have been everything to her. All day she's just distressing herself with this pea because everything else is fine, but this one thing is causing her suffering because, and then from a relative point of view, it becomes huge for her. Um, but it is this, this idea that, you know, a lot of people want to avoid suffering. And obviously there's some sorts of suffering that it would make sense for us to do our best to avoid where possible. Mm. You know, you're not jumping in front of buses unnecessarily. But yeah. Don't tempt me. <laughs> 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 Just to see what it feels like. Yeah. But, yeah, I think I think there's something in that. Don't don't seek out extra suffering because like you you will, it will come your way. You don't have to go and find it. Sure, mm. find it in workouts and listen to sad songs and all of that stuff. But the true, the the real suffering, right? Like mm. it will find you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I found for myself a great way to kind of create that um, polarity is like is travel. Like travel has taught me so much. Some of the countries I've been to, like I spent some time in India and like Ethiopia and I even in parts of South America. And it's only in sometimes in those moments you're like, fuck my life is really, really fucking privileged that I can just come and visit this place like very yeah. easily. Or I had forgot my, my parents are from Jamaica, so I've got family there. And I think one of the first times it really hit me, I went there when I was 13 years old and I was talking to one of my cousins and she was like, yeah, so I walk for five kilometers to get to school. I have to pay for all my school books. Like I don't get anything for free. And I was telling, I was like, yeah, yeah, school in the UK is free. And she's like, oh, everyone must really love school. They must like go there so joyfully. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, they don't. Like some people just don't even bother turning up and she like mouth open wide. And I think it kind of hit me. It was like, oh, wow, there's this thing I have that's called school. That's actually a massive privilege, but I'd never been anywhere that it had been the opposite of being a privilege. So I'd never had that experience. And it really changed how I relate, I changed, completely changed how I worked at school, actually, that conversation with my cousin. It was quite a pivotal moment in life. And I want to touch on what people say about deserving things. I, you know, I do a lot of, most of my coaching is like dating and relationships. And a lot of people are like, mm. I deserve love. And I'm like, you don't deserve shit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you don't deserve shit. You, you, you work for what you deserve. Um, you know, but I don't believe that, do we all deserve love? I don't know if we all deserve love. 
I don't know. I don't believe it. I don't think there's a mm. deserving nature. It's very entitled. So it's all because it creates this kind of idea that I just should just exist and I should be loved. Right. Mm. And that's just how it should be. But actually, life's a bit more about, you know, what you do and, you know, the cards that you've dealt and what you do with those cards to create the things that you kind of deserve. And some people are particularly unlucky in terms of location and so forth. That means that even if they wanted to create certain things in their life, they is they are at a massive disadvantage of doing so. Mm. Yeah, it's like the whole idea of a meritocracy is like the the most privileged idea ever. It's like a bunch of old white guys who are really rich. Like guys, if you just work hard, you'll get what you deserve. It's like, mm. <laughs> is is that necessarily the case? Um, I, I also, just what you were saying on Jamaica, I went to watch a Carla speak at South Bank Centre a couple of months ago, and he was talking about this, how um, in the Caribbean, a lot of the schools, like people work so much harder over there than you do here. And a lot of people will migrate from Jamaica t- kids to an English school and be like, oh my God, these kids are terrible. <laughs> they are not well behaved <laughs> and they do not like understand the privilege it is to be receiving an education that's why like literacy levels i think in jamaica are higher than they are in the uk yeah they are they are which like if you look at the economy of both of those countries you would assume that that shouldn't be the case yeah yeah definitely yeah this is it's nuts I, like, I, I didn't work very hard at school yeah at all yeah, it was yeah, it's it's. I saw him talk actually a couple of years back, and he said something. I think that he really hit me. He was like, he. I think it was in. I can't remember what countries he used, but he he used the UK, and I think he used the United States example. He was like, these are the only two countries or a group of countries I've been to where kids are bullied for being smart. <laughs> in every other part of the world you go to, when a child is really smart in class, everyone's like, oh, awesome. Like, can you help me? I want to talk mm-hmm. to you. I want to know you. It's like, how have we created this dynamic in this country where a child in your, in your, a kid being smart in your, in your class is in somehow a way for you to um, try and marginalize them in some way. It's like, it's, it doesn't make any real sense. Yeah. He spoke about that at, at this thing I went to as well. I called it like the Carlton effect. <laughs> you know, like in the Fresh Prince, to like Carlton's yeah. the nerd, he's the loser, he gets bullied. Will's dumb and cool, so he gets like put on a pedestal. Yeah, it's 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 sad. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. And to hop back onto happiness, mm. and I'm interested in because I know you're uh, a huge fan of social media, <laughs> <laughs> and. You know, I have a lot of conversations with people around social media because I spend probably a lot of time on social media. I can't help it. It's a, it's a partly business, partly enjoyment. I do find myself learning a lot. But a lot of people have a really negative relationship with social media, you know, Instagram. They find themselves on there and it really affects their their happiness quite negatively. Um, what are your thoughts on this? And I imagine you've also read uh, Mark Manson's second book, which is... Oh, Everything is well. fucked a book about hope um, and yeah. he talks about social media doesn't he and, and happiness in that if I remember rightly was this... god I can't remember that was a lot oh. that was a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> but, nonetheless what's what's what are your opinions and the way that social media kind of affects our ability to be to be happy with ourselves and our lives so one of the main reasons that I dislike social media isn't necessarily because it impacts people's mental health in a bad way it's the whole ads thing is that our attention is a commodity and like there are algorithms far smarter than we could ever be that that keep us on those apps that are the reason that every when you go and check a whatsapp all of a sudden you're watching someone's instagram story and oh no i've just watched 30 people's instagram stories like it's like that kind of thing i have i have a real issue with because i think it's just such dead time Mm. um and the people who kick back when I mouth off social media are, are people who I think have a healthy relationship with it. Who are like, yeah, I follow like a hundred people. It's all educational. I go on, I check and I'm done with them at half an hour. But like in the nineties, if I like came up to him, like, Hey, when you're older, you're going to have a little computer in your pocket. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to look at it and other people's lives for three hours a day. <laughs> You've like, well, what's the point in carrying on then (laughs) um so that's i'm annoyed at the attention economy as opposed to like stuff on social media 
but then there's other then there, then there are people on social media that's quite a an easy thing to deal with it's like unfollowing people who are wacko right create your own little echo chamber that's also a bit of a negative is that we end up in echo chambers because we protect our mental health and then we end up just getting the same opinions from people that we like and agree with so that's an issue even when you protect yourself you end up in an echo chamber and you kind of get out of touch um it's so clear like what it's doing to younger people's mental health like a lot of young girls and like self-harm like some on tiktok they like glorify self-harm which i don't think is a good thing i'm probably not alone in thinking that um and i also i hate that i have to rely on it that's like mm. one one of the biggest things is and, and you'll probably understand this working on there is that i have to have people like me to do my job well and i hate that because i'm not particularly bothered about being liked by the masses which guess makes me a bad instagrammer <laughs> um because I'm, I'm not that bothered about like having loads of conversations with loads of people that follow me and like oh my god what you did is great i'm like yeah thanks I th- we're never going to meet in real life it, this is this is not real I, I have such a sense of the like the faux connection that social media provides us with um and i'm i was pretty upset about it i was thinking i'm gonna have to come off social media and then i've just stopped reading books um about it but if anyone wants wants to read a good book on what technology is doing the large role technology plays in in our attention stolen focus by johan hari is is pretty good it doesn't provide any solutions but sometimes it's good to just know your enemy <laughs> <laughs> well yeah it's um it's the comparison that i see creeps up for me it's like mm. You know, I'll be like, oh, for example, I'll be like, ah, oh, I see Ed's real. I'm like, man, his reels are so funny. I'm not funny. Like, what's wrong with me? I can be, I could be this funny. Why, why, what's wrong with me? What am I doing? Then this self-hatred kind of gets directed at myself. Um, and I can imagine for a lot of people, if that's the conversation they're having continuously when they go on social media, it really has a detriment to one's mental health. Like, I found this kind of weird sweet spot where I follow people that I like and I take like educational value from it Mm. and I've kind of done the echo chamber thing and I'm a bit more aware of it now. Like my echo chamber, I started to remove anyone who any accounts I felt were like woman hating or man hating, like Mm -hmm. any of that sort of stuff I've kind of removed from my, my feed, anything, what else have I kind of removed? I've removed a lot of anyone to do with fitness because I think a lot of the fitness industry is just bollocks. Uh, most people could just do with like eating a little bit better um sleeping a little bit more and exercising regularly and they'll be perfectly fine yeah. so that's a lot of that's disappeared so i've kind of got it into this point now where i'm like oh i'm quite happy to go and scroll for a little while on instagram the people i know and like i'm interested in their lives but i also see how as you were saying about the echo chamber that maybe i need to bring more of the stuff in that i don't like so that i have more perspective on life and the world in general I think this is where reading comes into play because because this is where you're doing it on your own terms. You could get books from like a hard lefty and someone on the hard right and just mm. read them both and be like, right, which one of you makes the most sense? The poster, and this is a problem, is politics on social media as well, is that everyone is apparently educated on politics. Um, that's an issue. Uh, around the time of the election, I think I'm going to have to delete instagram <laughs> <laughs> um then actually also maybe it is quite a positive thing because it, it allows for greater spread of good information but also a greater spread of, of misinformation as well um i don't think that was a question you asked maybe you didn't even ask a question i'm lost <laughs> how social media how social media hurt our happiness some, uh, yeah that was, the question. Uh, that was the, well i think i think it gives question. you the wrong idea it it, it, yeah. it shows you what other people think happy is, but the whole, like the beauty of life is you have to work it out for yourself. Mm. And it's the trial and error that gets you great experiences and memories and helps you pass time in a good way. And it's not other people's version of happiness or their, their fake version of happiness that yeah. we see on the, on the screen. Um, but, 
kind of we take in. I, I traveled around the world a few years back. Well, for you actually, I tell a lie now. It's like what, six years ago now. And I found myself like posting all these beautiful photos of wonderful beaches and stuff like that. So then like every week I would post a picture of some really shitty situation that I found myself in. Mm. And one of them was I was on a bus in Laos and this bus was probably for about 15 people. And there was probably about 25 people on the bus. And instead of a floor, they had bags of hay, which they were obviously transporting for, for money. And it was probably one of the most uncomfortable experiences of my life. But when people travel, they very rarely tell you about these really shitty things that happen quite yeah. often. So I would go out my way to be like, this thing is really shit and I'm very angry about this. But look, this is this is what it really looks like. Yeah. And people, we don't do this enough on social media, like say, you know, like, you know, I imagine you spend a lot of time creating content. Most people don't realize how long it takes to craft an Instagram post that is quality and has usefulness to it. They just get yeah. the end result and think it's great. They don't see you sitting there for hours reading books and researching. But we, it's almost like we need to show more of the kind of back end work that's uncomfortable mm. and boring so that people get a better picture of what our lives really look like. Yeah. And then, but, but here's another thing is I think social media has, has made a narcissist of us all. Like we're not quite all narcissists, but we're at this point where we all just think that we're interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and i always worry when i say stuff like this because there are going to be people out there who absolutely do not think they're interesting at all and then me coming and saying guys you're not interesting get over yourselves is probably going to push them over to the edge to an existential crisis but i'd argue that a lot more people are on the other end of that scale where they're like guys this is how um this is what I had for breakfast. I think breakfast is such a common example, but it's, it's not great. But I, what always makes me laugh is when people are like, guys, this is my morning meeting that I've just done. Um, or, oh, look at me. Just doing something menial that isn't hard. That's like, maybe it's a bit annoying and it's a bit frustrating, but they're, and then they'll put like one of those voiceovers behind it. It's like, nobody's coming to save you. It's only you. And it's them just like making a protein shake in the morning. It's like, mate, do you know how fucking easy a protein shake is to get 25 grams of protein in? Like it is fucking capitalism in a shake, right? It's it's ease. It's not difficult to drink that. <laughs> Stop pretending that it's hard. Um, so yeah, I think there's this like people have a people are deluded. I've 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 tried to stop doing it. I've tried to stop showing like parts of my life that like I obviously think I'm interesting deep down. Like I have to, to protect myself from going insane. But like, I very rarely put things from like jujitsu. I put the first thing from jujitsu up in the last like six months the other day. I don't well, I went to Mexico and I didn't put any content on like a need to read, even though knowing these are the things that like get the metrics, but I just can't trust myself not to go over the edge of thinking that I'm too interesting. And, and and falling into the trap of telling everyone what I'm doing all the time. Um, but that is also an unpopular opinion because people don't want to face the fact that maybe they're in the category of, of a not interesting person who's trying to make themselves interesting. Um, and there's nothing wrong with not being interesting. It's just fucking life, isn't it? <laughs> Can't all be great and interesting and like Elon Musk, who probably also has a very boring life, like at the same time, <laughs> it's, it's mental. I'd, we were on, on the subject of happiness. I, I've, in the webinar that I did on that, on the reframing happiness, I, I just said to people like, be careful who you admire on the internet because you're never seeing the whole story. And someone like, I, I'll tell you what, I, I've got it here. The, the pictures I had was Francis Ngannou, Elon Musk, Joe Rogan, Oprah, Paris Hilton, and Molly May. The people will be like, right, Francis Ngannou is uh, my idol. I love watching him on social media and I love his story. It's like, yeah, but guess what? You're never going to want to flee a diamond mine to get to Europe. So you're never going to want it as bad as him ever in your whole entire life. You won't, you won't know what that urge is like. So yeah, cool. He's your idol, but maybe go for something a little bit more realistic. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's another rant on how I think no one's interesting. <laughs> Apart from <laughs> Francis and Garno. <laughs> <laughs> 
and all these interesting people it's like we forget that much of their day-to-day life is probably really mundane and very similar yeah. to us like making food getting ourselves from a to b like speaking to our children arguing with our, our partners like you know, they do do some really interesting things in the same way that we probably do, but they also yeah. much of their life is probably 80% pretty mundane and boring. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, the, and people feel sad because they're not as interesting as that person who is trying really hard to show you that they're interesting. Like they're trying so hard to convince other people that their lives are amazing. It's, it's, bizarre to me I'd like I, I had a real shift of focus like I basically I went out with an Instagrammer um, <laughs> and I just noticed a few things that happened that were falsehoods in terms of content and then what was going on in their life and I was thinking I'm falling into that trap I'm out of it I'm done like I'm, I'm not gonna try and convince people my life's interesting if, if at the time I truly don't think it is <laughs> mm. I think that's uh, in going out of an Instagrammer. It's like you realize that some people create their lives that like everything is content. Everything is content. So like you can barely get through a conversation, you know, where there hasn't been some pictures that need to be taken so they can be posted. Like I've got a few Mm -hmm. friends who I've actually met through Instagram. I've met some really good friends through Instagram. And, And it's funny when I observe them, and they're the sort of Instagrams that have to, some of them have to put out content constantly of like, oh, I had mm. this meal. I'm in this restaurant. I'm going down the street. Oh, look at this view. Mm. And I'm not really one of those people. Like I do talk about my life a little bit, but not very much because I don't think it's that interesting. And to be honest, I forget most of the time. I don't care that yeah. much. Like it's, we yours is all like relationship focus. You're like, this is how I've done this. This is how I can help yeah. you. Like I, I get yeah. it with you. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> even, even with my girlfriend also, like we're both on Instagram, we do stuff together and, We'll be going out for, to eat, and I'm like sitting there, and she's like, "Okay, she's oh, she's taking a view of the restaurant," and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, "No, nah, I'm just happy being in the restaurant. It's nice." But mm. we people will have to. It becomes like a real role you have to keep in, you know, this role of like, I am an Instagrammer and I show my life, and there becomes this kind of disparity between what needs to be shown to people and what's really happening. And then I'll give you another level of, especially people who work as coaches and self help. And the coaches are going to hate me for this. There's coaches out there who are telling you all this information and saying you need to be like this and think this way and blah, 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 and do this stuff and blah, blah, blah. But in their own lives, their lives are fucked up because they're not doing anything, (laughs) any of the stuff Mm. they're telling you. And I've heard this from a few other coaches I know who have gone to like massive coaching seminars and met people who have written multiple, multiple books about Mm. mindset and blah, 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 and met people who are like you know, complaining over $2 on a bill and stuff like that. And these people are multimillionaires. And he said to me, a friend of mine said to me, he's like, Dave, some of these people, they basically have sold people a dream that is completely a lie and they don't live it because it's worse. It's, it's not so much if the dream they're selling is a lie, but they live the lie because they believe it, but they don't even believe the lie they're selling you. And they live in this kind of opposite manner in which they're, they're trying to teach you and train you. You've just put into words something I've been thinking for a very long time. Um, it's it's heartbreaking to see the amount of people who are they've convinced themselves that's that's the problem is they've they've convinced themselves of this thing because they know that it's sexy and it sells money to to have these like mindset hacks um and they've unfortunately yeah they've convinced themselves it's it's totally mental and they forget that they're not perfect and they never ever will be but they've convinced other people that they are and that they can have this this perfect life um yeah it's it's mental the whole aiming at a dream life i don't if you've heard of the end of the history illusion this is quite a good thing and i talk about this no no the happiness anyway because we are terrible as full stop um no we are terrible at predicting the future right the last mm. two three years should have shown us that we have no control over what's to come um coaches online like life coaches 
try and tell people to aim towards these clear goals, these visions of like, how happy will you be in 10 years time? Like, oh yeah, I'm going to be so happy. Grow up is what I would say to those people because you can't predict the fucking future. The end of history illusion essentially means that we think we have experienced enough growth um, in our personal traits and our values to a point that right now history for us is is over we can say that we'll have these values and our, these personality traits for the rest of our lives so any decisions we make now are pretty well informed considering we're going to be the exact same for the next rest of our lives but in reality like if, if i ask you to look back 10 years how much have you changed in that period i in what, some ways, a lot. And in some ways, not at all. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's there's small parts of you that are are the same, but we don't know what they're going to be. We don't know that what we're going to get to a point in ten years and be like, oh, that I knew that that part was going to be the same. It's like I last I was seventeen when I ten years ago, and I was throwing eggs at people outside my voctal courser like a lot, far too much. <laughs> <laughs> I was like punching people for little to no reason in nightclubs. Like I was a terrible human and luckily I, like i've changed but i'm under no illusion that by the time i'm 37 i'll be completely different to how i am now and it and it does slow down a little bit as we get older i think it's like past like 50 60 years old it does slow down um or like minimize how much we change but it's we still can't make those predictions of what we're going to be like in 10 years time which is really annoying <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> we, we'd like to give this idea we can kind of control where we get to. And I, and I get this, we have this illusion of control in our lives a lot. And there's probably a very small band of things that we can kind of control. Like we can kind of control our actions to a certain degree day to day. And we can, you know, maybe control our breakfast if we want, but maybe then, you know, the, the shop around the corner sells out of yeah. muesli or something. But there's so much in life that we can't control that we would like to and we kind of obsess about and actually can create a lot of unhappiness. Mm. But there's also a lot of things we can control, I feel, that we don't spend enough time trying to do so. Like, mm. like what? you know, like, I, I think, so, you know, something like, I know you're a big fan of meditation because you have an incredible streak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I watched your streak in, in awe. <laughs> but like something as little as that, that most people were like, oh, it's hard. I'm not doing it. And meditation's hard. Yeah, meditation is meant to be hard. It was designed to be hard. It's designed yeah. to familiar, familiarize yourself with failure. Learn yeah. to fail every morning for 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever you want. But like something like that, those 10 minutes, you can, can't really control the 10 minutes, but you can control the fact that you sit down <laughs> and yeah. close your eyes and start. You can control that. That's within your control to do that. Maybe we can do some work around how we relate to our emotions so we can kind of have more control over not necessarily how we express them, but just knowing that they're existing for us. That mm. creates a little bit more of control. But these are two areas that people go, yeah, that's hard. I don't really want to do that. I'll just leave that to kind of, you know, I'll leave that to the gods. Oh, you know, the universe will sort out how I feel and, and, and my mind state. But actually, it kind of areas where I see that people don't kind of, take some control where they could yeah it's um it's something i had to come to terms with i think it was just before christmas i had a like a bit of an existential crisis and when i say a bit off like it was it was terrible i was getting stoned at like 7 a.m every single day i couldn't things were not great <laughs> um but also pretty great at the same time um, <laughs> <laughs> um the we don't like to admit that we've never had control. If we look back over our lives, you see all these little mistakes, the little things that have been thrust upon us and didn't, we didn't control being born, but it starts there. Um, it's, it's mental that people ever think that they should have like total control over their lives. Like imagine how boring that would be to be really the author of like what you do every single day. It'd be nuts. And like the, the science is there. Free will actually doesn't exist to the extent that people think it does. And, and that's, that's a tough thing to come to terms with, but like the evidence is, is a mountain and, and a lot of people are in denial about it. Um, I wouldn't recommend looking into it so much. So just basically take what I said and, and pretend it's a lie, but free will is, is not, not as much a thing as people would like to think. <laughs> um which is, that's where it starts, right? Is the decisions that we make. 
Like we don't decide what our options are before we decide. And that's tough to come to terms with. We don't control pandemics. We like we can control, I guess, sitting down every morning. And I think like the thing that controlled me sitting down every morning to meditate, but I'd head streak, headspace streak that was like two months ahead of my flatmates. <laughs> so I had to continue. <laughs> I don't have a choice there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just about like tricking yourself into thinking like you, you have to do these things um, and oh yeah the whole control thing's nuts man it's just like tricking yourself into believing you have to do things or tricking yourself into believing that you have control over things mm. yeah I'd rather just try and bypass my free will as much as possible <laughs> <laughs> knowing that it's it's null and void <laughs> sure. create lots of structures yeah mm -hmm. so we talked about all the myriad of ways that happiness eludes us and the things that make us unhappy and make us miserable and the you know our illusion of control which makes us miserable too um what are some of the ways in which we can create a level of, I'm going to use a couple of words, not just happiness, but also contentment as well. Because I think contentment, satisfaction, what are some of the ways that we can have control over creating contentment and kind of satisfaction and happiness in our lives, like in real tangible ways? It's the least sexy answer possible, but it's being content with less. Because this cycle of wanting that we're in is well it's horrible because there's there's always something else there's always a little bit more that you need we're never just happy with what we have we mm -hmm. can't just make do and that sucks like that is at our detriment that we have convinced ourselves that there is always that that, that little bit more that will get us what we want or need or don't know that we want just yet if you learn about like advertising, that is a good way of stopping yourself from buying loads of shit. Right. And I used to be really bad for buying shit and I, I haven't like shopped online apart from books since I read, I read Seneca's book, uh, letters from a stoic. And I know he didn't have Amazon or anything like that, but it was really inspiring <laughs> for me. Um, because he, he spoke about Epicurus, who's like um, the founder of Epicurean philosophy. It was kind of like an enemy of Stoics because they essentially just had a really simple life. I've had the same breakfast every day for, I don't know, five years. That's a good way of keeping things simple. And I get it that variety is the spice of life, but you get more joy out of restriction at times. Um, so, yeah, I think if you want to be happier, just like lower your expectations a little bit I, th I think that's a really good way of doing things it sucks that that's how we do it it'd be nice if it was like well if you just do this for 10 minutes a day you'll be great so actually just lower your expectations Bo Burnham has a brilliant song about this when it comes to um dating do you, do you know Bo Burnham no okay he's an American comedian but he does like a musical show I'll, I'll send you a link to it off, after this conversation, but he has a song about lowering your expectations when it comes to looking for love. And mm -hmm. I thought, actually, why don't I just do that in the whole of life? Then I can be happier. And since I've done so, things seem to be all right. I think the, it's interesting you say lowering your expectations in love. It's one of the things I see in the world of dating and relationships is we all, you know, kind of comes in with this deserving love thing. We kind of have this idea that we can all have this really amazing relationship with this really amazing person who is really beautiful and they will help us grow and all these things. And a friend of mine who's also a coach, he, he put it really simply to me. He's like, people need to realize where their number's at, like what's really, you know, where they're really at and what's really possible because if they, if we keep having this illusion of, and, and it's entitlement to a certain degree, like, oh, I can have this amazing thing. 
we'll just be miserable because we'll always be thinking mm. that this thing we should have, but we don't have. So why don't we have it? There must be something intrinsically wrong with us and it creates a level of self-loathing. Yeah. But actually, if we lower expectations in life and start going, okay, maybe I'm never going to make two million a year. Okay, it'd be nice, but I, I, that might not come yeah. to me in this lifetime. I could be a bit happier with my, you know, 40,000 or whatever it is that I make and just have joy in that. And maybe it'll incrementally move up and I can take joy in each new hundred or thousand pounds that I'm earning. Mm. But there's also, it, it's, it's funny because then you have the dissatisfaction part that actually drives us forward. And you, you see how we just built for this cocktail of like this sweet spot of like living in this between dissatisfaction and being content, but like lowering our expectations because we pull ourselves down and it's like a bar we can, a bar we can touch, bring the bar down and we can bring a level of, of contentment to what we have. And we can appreciate having it more instead of always looking, you know, further along the way going, Oh, I wish I had that. We can like yeah. really savor the thing we have now. Like you must really savor your breakfast every morning. Yeah, man, I have a, I'm very passionate about spreading the message of this breakfast and I have peanut butter and scrambled eggs on toast. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, it is incredible. If anyone likes peanut butter and scrambled eggs, have peanut butter and scrambled eggs on toast. It will change your life <laughs> for the better. Um, I was about to say something. I cannot remember what it was. I, I just think this, like the ambition, like ambition good, not ambition and contentment bad. That's kind of like the narrative that's out there. And I don't think that's very fair. You'll notice in a lot of like fiction books, the characters will have like a seed of ambition or a seed of nihilism. It's one or the other. And that's that's the that's the task that they have to overcome. Like seed of ambition being something that a character has to overcome can be seen throughout literature, like throughout history. So mm. There is something in ambition being a bit detrimental for people. And people listening who are really ambitious hearing this, like, oh my God, he is such a hater. He needs to read some David Goggins. He needs to <laughs> he needs to want more for himself. He doesn't want all of this, like all that he could have. So well, actually, all that I've got is, is pretty good. Like when you make that honest assessment of it. It's like I don't need to be hell bent on trying to accumulate more things or relationships and stuff like that. Um, I think it's it's a constant journey coming to that kind of mindset. Like it, it is tough because you do every now and then have a little bit in your mind saying, "You deserve more. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> you could be great." <laughs> oh, could I, mate? Seven billion people. There's only enough space <laughs> for. For people who want to make sacrifices enough to be great, and I don't think I'm one of them. <laughs> mm. I'm, um, as you say that, I'm thinking of the phrase that you know, falling falling in love with the process. Mm. You know, of of growth, of learning, of difficulty. And I, you know, I don't. I'd love to hear your opinion on that as well. That that phrase, I, the part of me doesn't like the phrase, but I also see there's an element of truth. There's a big element of truth for me, actually, personally. It's like, instead of just having this goal, you know, the carrot at the end of the stick, actually, that's a terrible one. I'll take that analogy mm -hmm. back. That's a terrible one. That's not going to work. Um, having this goal that's like far out and just being so fixated on that. But actually, the I feel like the happiness, the joy, the contentment comes more when you enjoy each step along the road to getting there. Because then that goal, and it sounds so cliche, but I feel like the goal doesn't matter so much because you're like, oh, I'm enjoying my day-to-day -day life or, you know, doing these little hard things that are hard, but they give me satisfaction. I feel like I've achieved something which brings me a certain level of joy. When actually that is the falling in love with the process is part of the the, the kind of journey of, of life. Yeah. I always think like, you're never going to love the process, but what else are you going to do? <laughs> you got to do something right we know it sucks when you sit around and mope about all day that is really bad and sometimes you need to do that sometimes you need to have a day that you just write off and and, and chill out for but truthfully like just find a couple things that you enjoy doing make them the process you don't have to know what the process is for you, you have to kind of love life like 
the the love of fate like frederick nietzsche was big on this he was a nutcase but he was he was big on just like being willing to get to the end of your life and say again like get ready to go and do the whole thing again because mm. you know that you have no other option and let's face it that's a possibility we don't know that that's not the case <laughs> Um, but yeah, he, he takes from the Stoics the more fatty, like the love of fate. Like we don't even have to call it a process, but we just have to love whatever is in front of us right now. Not wholeheartedly, not passionately, but what other option do we have? I guess the other option for us is to like, what a lot of us do, we run away from what is in front of us mm. right now. That we talked about this earlier. It's like, oh my God, there's this difficult thing in front of me. Let me run over here and look at Instagram instead. But actually... Yeah. The process is to go, oh, wow, I've got this new boss and he's an asshole. Okay, like I can just run away from this and maybe, you know, quit your job might be the, the thing you need to do. But also like confronting this person and speaking to them about their behavior and being like, how can I maybe act a bit differently to make this situation better is in fact the, yeah. the, the cards that fate has, has delivered you. Yeah, like it's, it's hard to have a bad boss and it's hard to have a conversation with a bad boss about why you think they're a bad boss. But this is, there's a book called Lying by Sam Harris, and it's incredible, and it obviously talks about lying and how important it is to not lie in your life. After I've read that book, I, I still lie sometimes, small lies, to, and, I, and I hate myself when I do it. Mm. But if I have something like I need to say to someone or a conversation that I need to have, I just I get it out there because it, it, I've worked out it's easier just to get the conversations out of the way, even though it's that like a little bit more difficult um, than avoiding it for a long period of time. Because that prolonged avoidance, I don't know what it is about it, man, but it doesn't make you feel good in the long run. I'd rather just have like an uncomfortable conversation, lose a friend, whatever, who cares, like what it is, than live with the repression for a long time. And I and I forget that sometimes like I've 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 kind of always been one of those people who just a- attacks stuff. Like when I have an idea and I've got it in my mind, I just do it. Uh, and I feel like a lot of people are actually like that. A, a lot more than those who give themselves credit for it because they do make decisions every day and they do act on on whatever those decisions are it's just those decisions might not be ones that serve them so well um so yeah i think that people might need to just make a decision and go for it a little bit more which is god i sound like a terrible cliche horrible instagrammer but having those conversations, not lying to yourself and just doing what you kind of think is, is the best option every now and then is, is pretty good for you. Yeah. I'm reminded that it's, I'm a, I'm one of those people who's avoidant of difficult conversations. I'm like, Oh, I don't really want to have this conversation. And I, and I've come to realize a little bit about for myself, what, why it's so horrible to avoid because you almost relive having the conversation constantly because you think about it you're like okay mm. i'm gonna have this conversation this way and then you're like oh no then you start thinking about all the ways it could go wrong so you're almost you almost force yourself to live the pain of the bad conversation it not going well the the, the various terrible end results that could be could happen for however long you avoid having the conversation so it kind of builds up internally it's like you've had the conversation a thousand times yeah and you've never had it in the way that it's actually going to go. It's probably going to go a lot better than now you've imagined it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I'm interested in um, your meditation streak and how, how do you feel that this has shaped your level of happiness in your life? How has it affected how happy you feel in your life? I'll, I'll caveat this first of all so so I've, I've meditated now for two years every single day and throughout that two years i've been severely depressed probably three or four times so like it's it's not a cure-all it, it doesn't work like that but reminding myself every single day that i have no control over my mind is one of the most helpful things i've ever done 
because I have a that tendency to be pretty mean to myself, and sometimes that that runs away from me. And every now and then, I can just be like, "Whoa, buddy, slow it down." Remember that that voice can be interrupted every now and then. Um, and like you were saying earlier, like it it gets you in touch with failure. You sit down in the morning without really any, any any expectation it took me about six months to stop putting an expectation on on it you just sit down and kind of just go to war with yourself in 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 the way that you wouldn't think that you'd have to go to war in like an eastern way as opposed <laughs> to like our western like oh let's just attack things head on it's like the like the the woo way from from the Tao. like just just be with it um i've read i've read a book by alan watts earlier this year uh, called the way of zen which I, I wouldn't recommend reading actually it's not it's not that great um but he talks about how meditation is about not trying and the way that he frames this is like when you try to sink in water you end up floating and when you try to float you end up sinking so that's what you have to do in meditation it's like you have to give up to succeed in meditation and i like i like that attitude i like that relinquishing of control every single day i think it's it's a healthy pursuit and i absolutely know that i feel better when i meditate as opposed to when i don't so if i leave it until like the evening it's probably not going to be a good day but if i do it in the morning it's got like a 10 percent chance of, of being a better day than it would have been if i hadn't and i like those odds <laughs> yeah yeah I always feel my I've regularly meditating for probably four or five years now. I haven't quite got the the closest I got to your your streak is like I think I got up to like 240 days. And then I went out and got really drunk and completely forgot the next day, which yeah. was like almost hard. I, it was the only time times... hard time for that. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I was like lying there one evening and I was, and no, the next morning. And I was like, fuck, I forgot to meditate. Oh, I've destroyed my streak. And, you know, I really did beat myself up that, that time. Um, <laughs> but it is this time in the day where I'm forced to kind of surrender to what is, I can't control what's going to happen in those 10 minutes. I can sit down, I can close my eyes and I can breathe because the breathing kind of happens quite naturally. Um, <laughs> But other than that, there's nothing I can really do. I can kind of be like, okay, I'm going to do a really good job now. I'm going to do a good, it's going to be a good meditation, this one. Um, but actually you are at the will of your of your mind. And it is a very, it could be very challenging to be at the will of the mind, especially when the mind is, you know, does what the fuck it wants. Mm. And I've, I've, I've really, you know, I've been on meditation retreats. I did a Vipassana, I did 10 days of silence. Wow. And that was... That was one of the hardest experiences of my life, but it was incredible. Like, you know, yeah, I bet. when I walked out of that door, the level, I really learned a lot about myself that my relationship to pain really changed during that period. Um, but meditation is a really special thing in that it's not what you think it is. It's not going to feel like you think you're not going to be like all enlightened afterwards. Your mind's not going to be clear all the time. I once spoke to a monk when I was in Thailand and I was like, oh, you've been, you know, you've been a monk for like 25 years. Like meditating must be so easy. And he was like, no, mine's still like monkey. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> surely, you know, you know, he was like, no, mine's still like monkey. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, so that's just, that's just what it is. I know that, is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. I was like, oh shit. But it's definitely... Like what, what meditation has done for me is it's definitely given me that ability to take a couple of steps back from my thinking. If there's anything, mm. it just allows me to be like, Oh, look, I'm thinking stuff. I'm just mm. thinking this stuff constantly. You know, when I really, there's times where I've, you know, upped it to like half an hour a day and I'm just like, Oh, I'm thinking this stuff. Oh, look at me thinking this stuff. I'm always thinking this stuff. Yeah. Instead of being it's like, Oh my God, this is who I am. Oh my Lord. You know, that's the kind of difference I find with regular practice. If you could bottle that and sell it, that that ability to just be like, oh look, I'm thinking stuff. Oh, you'd you'd make cabillions. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd be so happy with the cabillions. 
<laughs> it's it's your life changes when you realize the like gap between thinker and thought and it's so hard to put your finger on it but like us every now and then i'll be like thinking something and i'm like god that guy in there is insane but luckily i'm not him <laughs> <laughs> oh, and people yeah. that haven't it's it's so annoying because people who haven't witnessed that think a thought thing or got to the point where they're actually okay admitting that there's there's the gap between the two it might actually sound a bit insane mm. <laughs> <laughs> might sound crazy like what there's two people inside your head just like yeah, yeah. that's yeah. an understatement mate there's like 40 <laughs> <laughs> and there's one of them doesn't say very much just kind of watches yeah. it all <laughs> but he knows everything <laughs> <laughs> i always picture them as um you know when you watch uh men in black there's a moment in yeah. one of them where the person's head opens up and there's just a little alien inside yeah that's how i that's how i picture my my witness in my mind he's just kind of sitting there like doo -doo -doo. <laughs> Just sitting there, Watching disappointed. <laughs> At all the crazy shit, I think. Yeah. It's like, right, how do we march this guy straight to prison? <laughs> or straight to the kitchen. I was often where I find myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, thank you, Ed. I'm going to wrap up there. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the, the laughs and the, the what some people might feel is a very um, radical view on happiness, you know, lowering the bar. But also it just feels like a very, what I got is just like this very present way of experiencing happiness. Like being here and now with what is, instead of tying one's happiness to something uncontrollable in the future. Yeah. For sure. I think that summarizes it quite nicely. I just like, I want people to kind of, you don't have to enjoy the struggle of life that much. You don't have to be one of those people who's like, oh, I love pain and suffering. But it's like, just understand that like it, it is all part of it. Um, it's like the, the myth of Sisyphus, right? Like the guy he tried to trick the gods. He tried to trick death. So the gods punished him to push a boulder up a hill and then the boulder's going to roll back down to the bottom for eternity. In your life, you're going to be pushing stuff up a hill a lot. But every now and then you get a break and you get to walk down to the bottom. But then you do have to start again. Mm. And you have to start pushing. And oh, that's that's cool. Like we get to do that. We get to carry on. It's part of the cost of like enjoying the good stuff mm. is, is having to deal with some of the shit stuff. And Oh, it's hard to make people see that. I'm working out how, but it'll be a long time until I've got enough information to be able to make a, a strong, strong case for this argument. Sounds like a, sounds like a good book. <laughs> yeah, one day, one day. <laughs> uh, so, um, Ed, where, where can the listeners find you and listen to more of you as well? Uh, I have a website now. So I've got a fancy new website. Uh, it's a need to read.co.uk uh, or on Instagram. There's links for everything like my mailing list where every week I'll just try and destroy people's hopes and dreams and make them probably a bit happier in the process. Um, it's all uh, that's at a need to read with the number two, not the word. Mm. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And also you have a podcast as well. Oh, and also the podcast, yeah. So whilst you're on this app, um, type in a need to read in wherever you get your podcast from. Click subscribe, give me a review before you listen. Uh, <laughs> and there's a there's a lot of episodes on there. I think you've done a lot of episodes as well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Got through a lot. You've got yeah. you've got a lot. And this, and I feel like I feel like Ed's really down playing his podcast. He has some incredible guests, some wonderful writers. The chances are there's a book that you've read that you would really enjoy. And Ed interviewed that writer. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Be unlike me to downplay anything I've done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, maybe all right then. I'll, I'll Oliver Berkman's book and uh, the interview I had with Oliver Berkman 
He wrote a book called 4,000 Weeks, which I'd recommend everyone to read after listening to my podcast with, with Oliver Bertman, because he's my hero. <laughs> it must be amazing to, to interview your hero. <laughs> you think, but on the, on the day it was. But it, like, it was just, it was just a conversation on it. Like it was cool for like five minutes. Then I was like, wow, just tell me everything that you know, please. So I guess it's cool, but like you can see, I don't get that excited about stuff. <laughs> mm. <laughs> just another guy. You, you just realize, you know, he's just another human being. Yeah. And he looks a little bit like my dad. So I was, it was kind of weird. <laughs> 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 like really, really similar. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> uh, so, listeners, you know, if you've enjoyed the episode and you've learned something, then most more important, if you've learned something, tell us. You, know, you can find me and Ed on Instagram. Slide up in the DMs and let us know what you've learned. I always like to hear from people when they've listened to the episode because sometimes the thing someone's learned is really something that's quite surprising to me. And it's always nice to, to speak to people. Um, I quite enjoy speaking to, to listeners. I've even bumped into, I actually bumped into a listener in an airport not too long ago. And I felt like, Oh my God, I'm famous. Um, Unreal. So, so yes, get in contact. Let's know um, what you learned, what you've taken away and head over to Ed's podcast and take a listen and also review. You could review mine too, actually. I always forget to ask people to do that. Um, yeah. That would be great too. But until next week, ciao, ciao from me. And thank you, Ed. Ciao, ciao from me.